2nd of December, year 2021. I hope everyone is doing well, getting ready for Christmas. It's a couple of days before Christmas, and this is our Facebook Live um, right before Christmas. So Merry Christmas and um, Happy Holidays to everyone. Have a joyous um, holiday season. And uh, here we, we welcome our panel. Um, we have April, who is a psychic and a spiritual teacher. She is on a regular person on our panel, always here for us. So thank you, April, for being here. And then we are joined by Patricia, who is a fellow member of our Facebook group. Good evening, Patricia. And then we are joined by uh, I, Ellen is here for the very first time. So good evening, Ellen. And then we also have our wonderful Ken, sweet and precious Ken, right? Uh, good evening, Ken, who is a, a regular member of our group meditation group as well that we meet on Fridays. So to start off with, I'll start with the question that uh, Patricia had for me. She sent it to me on Messenger April. And I think we may have talked about this. I wish Kelly and Caesar were here. They would have said something more about this. But um, is there something you can say about deja vu, about soul um, and soul contracts and why do we experience this um, experience of deja vu? I think we've talked about it before with Caesar and Kelly, but go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, this is a this is a great topic for um, Caesar and Kelly for sure. That's a great topic for Kelly. Um, deja vu is something that I think all of us experience at one time or another. It is it's linked to um, kind of parallel realities, that concept, which is really hard to understand that we in, come in and out of parallel realities. In easy terms, it's basically where you feel like you have already experienced something. I just had this happen the other day. I was in my kitchen. My two youngest daughters were kindly messing around and saying things. And I just stopped and I look at them and I said, pretty sure I'm having deja vu at this moment. So it's, it's re-experiencing something. It's where you have this sense that I have already experienced this at one point. Now, whether this was you experienced it in another lifetime or you went to bed and you had a dream or, and that's usually what it is, or perhaps you were in a meditation um, or just daydreaming uh, about life or about scenarios. And, you know, a scene will play out. I think for mine, um, many of mine happen uh, from my dreams where I'm able to go. So again, when you go to sleep, you're able to come out of the body and therefore you are now free. You're now back into the energy being, which is free from timelines. And I know the concept of time is really hard to understand that there is no time, but once your soul comes out of this body, we don't have to follow the rules of the timeline. So I can go into the future. There's Caesar. He can help us out with this. Um, and I can experience something that is uh, going to happen. And I may not fully remember it, but then once it actually happens again, because we have cell memory, right? So if I experience something in the future, I come back to this, par this parallel, this timeline, my cells remember, oh, wait, yeah, we did this before. So that's what's happening. Do you want me to explain how I understood the concept of time? Do you want me to? <clears throat> so the, the concept that, because I think Patricia, I think that's one thing that you struggle with and I struggled with severely. And I still kind of struggle with it because it's, so, um, it's so different from our normal linear thinking that things happen um, you know, in an orderly fashion. And I just couldn't understand it. So 
uh, for years, I was like, what do you mean there's no time? There's time. Like it in five minutes, that's five minutes. That's time. That, that's, you know, what are you talking about? Tomorrow is definitely tomorrow. So they gave it to my oldest daughter is what they did. They, the universe source, she was about 14 years old and I just couldn't get this concept. She come home from the bus and she said, mom, do you know where that farm is that we pass by on the bus every day? And I said, yeah, I, I yeah, got it. She says, well, I realized that there's no such thing as time. And I just stopped everything I was doing. I was in the middle of making dinner. I was like, what? They're going to give it to you? <laughs> I've been asking for months to try to understand this. And she says, well, yeah, because I'm driving by that farmhouse and I'm on the bus. And she said, but I can't ever recreate that scenario. It's only right now. There is no future. There is no past. Even if I tried to recreate that scenario, mom, she's like, it wouldn't be the exact same time. It wouldn't be the exact same sky. The kids on the bus, Johnny would not have ate mom's spaghetti last night. It's not the exact same. You can't recreate it. It's only right now. Okay. So that's when I was like, oh, you can't go back in time. You can't go back to anything in the past. And I can pretend what's happening in the future, but the only thing that's really happening is right now. Right? So I don't know if that helps you to understand it a little bit, but that's when I was like, yes, there is only right now. But when we're talking about going out in the body, it erases the timeline that we follow by our laws. It erases that Oh, this is morning, this is night, this is evening. I see animals the same way. I don't see a cat going, you know, it's about 7 p.m. I should go to bed, it's getting dark. They live by what they feel. They don't live off of a timeline. We live off of a timeline because it keeps us organized. So when you erase that need for that timeline, you free yourself, you free your, your energy, your mind, and that allows you to flow into different spaces, allows you to understand that there's really, that restriction's really not there. It's, it's man-made, it's mind-made, right? So for the question, that is deja vu, is experiencing something that has happened, usually in the present, pretty much in the present, can be another uh, lifetime, but you're recalling it, you're re remembering it. And then I thought I would talk about time for some reason, right? <laughs> Try to understand time. So Caesar can help us with the deja vu too. Thank you so much, uh, April. And I'll come back with another question about the whole time thing. Let's ask Caesar. Uh, Caesar is, uh, as everyone knows, is our uh, the one person that is a, ch a channel on the panel, right? and a spiritual teacher. So welcome Caesar, good evening. We were, you know, the moment I asked the question, I was telling April that uh, I need Caesar and Kelly for this question. The question was asked by Patricia. Um, she was like, uh, uh, what is deja vu? And it's scary, right? That's what you said, Patricia. So Caesar, do you wanna say something about deja vu? And if you've heard some of April's answer, so. Yeah, I did. So deja vu is like when you see something and you feel like, wow, I've been here before. Um, and likely this was just part of your charts, part of your plan. You were supposed to be at that time at that moment. Um, and it's usually significant. So when this happens, the first thing I, I do is, why am I here? Why is this significant? Why did I see this before? Why am I here now? Again. Um, and there's always something really dynamic to the situation when that happens. If you can stop for a moment in time and root yourself in the present moment and just be still, um, the answer will come to you why this is recreating in yourself. And it's usually not once or twice. I have deja vu on the same things multiple times. And then when that moment comes and I experience what I've been seeing, I know I've been there a few times um that's when i just try to 
just really sink into the moment and, and pull out whatever it is that was the universe trying to show me something in that moment with that picture, that building, that place, that situation, whatever it is, there's always been a deep, deep, deep lesson um, or an experience, I should say. Then, of course, you got to extract the, um, the lesson from the experience. But it, uh, deja vu is very significant to um, to our lives. Um, and it's something that we have basically charted in the past. And obviously, when you come to that moment and you experience what you already know that you've experienced before, right? Is this what you guys consider deja vu to be? Yes. Okay. Um, so when that happens, um, it, it's basically alignment at that point. So there is something that you were after, whether you um, knew it or not. Like Abe says, you know, you create either by default, which is unknowingly, or you do it, you know, knowingly and deliberately. So you are a creator either way. And everything that shows up, you are the creator of. So you either do it by default unknowingly or deliberately, intentionally. So when that moment arises and you know you've been there before, you can just feel it with every cell of your body, like April was saying about the, you know, the memory, every cell in your body has the memory. But this is what triggers the whole deja vu experience. Um, so again, it's just important to figure out why you're there. And, and, and I promise you that next time this happens, you're going to see something really significant in that moment. And it is, it's pretty cool. And you can almost expect something of that moment. So ask yourself, what is your point of attraction with that moment? How are you feeling? These are the questions you just kind of ask yourself a little bit. How are you feeling when they showed up? Usually when you experience deja vu, you're just kind of like, you're not up here. You're not down here. You're just kind of like floating through the day. And then that shows up and you're like, wow, holy cow. And it's a big surprise, but you're like, yeah, I, man, I was here. I just did this. Like, this seems so real to me. Like I did this. I was here. I know I've seen this place many times. Everything is exactly the way it seems. I've never seen this before in the, you know, in the physical world. Um, so you could ex have experienced that, that point of attraction through a dream. Um, you know, like when you're kind of like floating around out there, um, yeah, so there is a lot of significance to recalling and, and actually being at that point of attraction. But pay attention to how you're feeling at that moment and figure out your point of attraction and um, and what is supposed to come of that because there is something there for you. It's like arriving, waking up on Christmas morning and, um, you know, when you're seven and expecting a present under the tree. You turn the corner and you see the Christmas tree. First thing you do is you look down, look for the gift and bingo, bango, there it is. So next time you experience deja vu, um, try that on. Is it like, uh, I'm going to take April's answer and your response, Caesar. Um, is it like we are existing in parallel universes and somehow during deja vu, they merged? That's exactly what happens. Uh, Right, we were he here doing something, but it was the same souls that we were working with. And here, and suddenly, somehow, there was a time collapse or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they collapsed, and we saw the same thing. And so we have a memory of both, right? The, yes. This universe. That's, that's, that's where the memory kicks in, and then you can be able to recall that time. And it doesn't necessarily have had to been in the past. This could have been a future experience that you're experienced prior to that. So it goes both ways. And that's what April said, that it could be a future experience. Right, April? Thank you so much. Ellen, did you want to say something about this? Just that I have experienced both future and past, and I'm really wanting to summon up a memory, but I'm unable to at this time. Utterly fascinating, fascinating. I'd love to hear anybody's experiences, anything. You, I, I truly feel I'm in the presence of greatness. This is most exhilarating. <gasps> Thank you so much, Ellen. 
Ken, did you have any experiences that you can recall on Deja Vu? Oh, don't I have some. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, boy. Um, You're the one that's going to come through with a practical well, experience. It's, um, oh, my God. There's some, of, some of them I can't reveal. Um, but, uh, yes, when I was, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, and it's all, a lot of it is about my mother and my father. I'm, I'm understanding the family secrets. I'm, under fan, I'm understanding how their stuff interfered with my development. And so I was told by an astrologist in 1999 that I had lived two past lives. And I had never shared some of the memories that I had with one of them. And in the late 1800s, I was a gay man and I was a writer. And when I was told in 1999, because most of my life growing up, my brothers and people would say, I should have been a girl because I was very sensitive and feeling. And I was gravitated to gay men. And I always wondered if I was possibly gay. And it really ate at me, but I never shared that with anybody. So when the astrologist said that, it really blew me away. She says, I lived in the late 1800s and being a writer, and in the, in, in the end of the 80s, I, all, I was telling everybody, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and I don't write. And um, then the lady, told, the astrologist told me, she says, but you have a lot of fear around that. And that's why you work outside. You don't like the inside because at that time, you couldn't, you were like in the closet, so you couldn't go outside. But she says, you have to write because you got so much going on now, you have to write. And I'm like, what is that? I had these feelings. So with that, and then she says, you lived another lifetime and you actually died in World War II. And you were, you died and you were a pilot and you died. Okay, so what I'm gonna jump on first is when I was four or five years old, I told my mother, I said, Ma, I wish my name was Patrick. And she went, why? And I says, I don't know, but I just really liked that name. And when I got married, I had two boys. Uh, the second child, I wanted to name Patrick. And my wife said, no, I don't like that name. I went, okay, can we have him as a middle name? No, I don't like that name. And anybody that had that name, I was gravitated to. And um, I had done some family constellation work in the early 2000s. And um, and and it was also this part of me in this lifetime too. I always want to fly a plane. And want to take lessons. So when I, when I did try that, I got sick to my stomach and I wanted to, and I said, take, take, take us down. So, and then, um, and during the family constellation, they mentioned that I had lived a past life and I was a pilot. So I had two different people telling me this. Okay, so here comes the real, Ticker. Um, about 12, 13 years ago, I said, Ma, can you tell me about your life? I don't know anything about you, and I don't know anything about dad. And she told me, she says, um, Yeah, um, I, um, I was in love with a man, and I was going to marry him. And um, but he had an accident. Uh, he, was in, he was in the war 
and he was a pilot and he had a crash and his name was Patrick. <laughs> that blew me away. Oh, wow. um, and I says, okay. So there, and now my mother was never close to me. My mother would never cry. My mother also told me when he did pass, she couldn't go to the funeral or go to his wake. And my mother doesn't cry at funerals and stuff. Okay, so, all right. So it took me time to put all these little pieces together. And with the, going back to the first time about being a writer, it was like, I've been struggling through, and I feel like this group is such a huge part of that development for me about finally, I feel like I'm crossing the bridge to uh, being not afraid. So I feel like a lot of my intense fear uh, had to do with what I felt when I was a gay man. I don't know how, why, but it's even like, even to, the synchronicities and everything goes on in this place. Like it's, <laughs> it's blowing me away. Um, so just with the, the topic and I'm realizing that because I know now that I have to speak and I'm starting to write and I'm enjoying it like crazy without fear. And so something is being developed just on what comes up in this group is bringing up, dredging up stuff that I need to let go of and stuff that I need to say, okay, that was the past, that's whatever. Me being present is allowing me to be in the now and to be able to express myself and realize that all those attachments that I had and all those fears and insecurities and so on, I just need to let them go. Um, and so I feel like I'm really, in a sense, coming out of the closet in a, in, in a way of being my true self. It doesn't really matter what I was holding on to. It's just, um, I don't know. And, and even like three days ago, I had a fight uh, with a brother and it was concerning my mom. My mom, my mother died a few years ago. Uh, and three days ago, it just hit me. Call up Bill and just get this out of the way. I called them up. So I'm releasing and letting go of so much stuff. And we had the most incredible conversation for a half, uh, for an hour and a half. And we never even brought up what, what we were upset about. It doesn't matter. So it's just so many things that just coming in about the past lives and about different things. And just realizing that any uncomfortability at all in any, any on how it's displaced, I'm realizing whether it's a past life or whether it's something that happened earlier in my life, it's something that needs to be addressed. And I have so much gratitude for feeling uncomfortability. And for the last three years of my life, that's when I've accepted that because I was always fighting and resisting and denying any uncomfortability. And now I'm like, no, no, it, it's, it's my shadow. It's, those are the nuggets that I need to address because those are the things that were weighing me down or diverting me away from my true self. So I'm just uh, so blessed to, uh, to be where I am now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. That's incredible. The personal experiences. Uh... I'm really seeing the significance in the, like I'm sharing things and it's like, I don't know, I don't know. It's, it, I'm like, anyway. Thank you. That just means you're okay with the isness, man. And that's what gratitude is all about. This moment is perfectly great, you know, perfectly acceptable as it is, whether you label it good or bad. Um, so um, congratulations to that. That's a nice spring forward. Thank you. He's living up his soul contract, right? He's erasing all that karmic memory of uh, being gay or having those kind of uh, 
even if it was in the 1800s, you're talking about 1800s, even in the 19th, 19, the 20th century, like I know people that are in their 50s and 60s that were gay men, and they have a great gay men or women, uh, they have a great deal of, um, I think one, it is the church because the church never accepted uh, gay men and women, right? So they have a great deal of anger and resentment towards the church. And the second is towards society because society does not, the whole, is it, uh, who was that in the Bible that, there's a biblical story, right? Somebody was, uh, there was a city, Sodom and Gomorrah or something, and so everybody, even the, the society in the 20th century rejected. So talk about 20th, this is 19th century that you're talking about. So how unaccepted was that, gener uh, that um, lifetime of yours, the past life, right? So you've come with that memory and then uh, build on that memory so you, you're holding um, that limiting belief that I'm not accepted. And here comes a mother and father that is not accepting of, and brothers, right? Siblings that are not accepting of who you are. Exactly. So we attracted with what is actually within us. There's nothing to do with the outside world, right? Exactly. I mean, there's so many other parts of this that at some point I'll, I'll share or, or, or talk about. And it is about the love. It's about so many things that have come together about I was always looking outside myself to have those needs met because they weren't met by mom and dad. So and I realized how much love that I am. And I was always that's what I wanted. And I realized I was that. But I denied it in myself. And now I realize the gift that they had given me by going through that experience. It's, it's, it's almost like things are coming together in ways that's so opposite of what my human understanding could comprehend. And unless I surrendered, there's no possible way I would have been able to work through all the different things I worked through. It's just a miracle, an absolute miracle. Perfectly said. Thank you, Ken. And then uh, I also wanted to show that um, in the relationship that your mother had. Um, so uh, in this book, Nature of Personal Reality, the way Jane Roberts and her husband are actually, chan she's channeling the book uh, and um, Caesar may be more familiar with the channeling portion, the mediumship uh, portion of it, but she's channeling the book, but her husband is also in trance trying to write the book for her, right, in shorthand. But what they say is in a previous lifetime, um, the husband was the father and she was the son. <laughs> mm. You are the reverse. Like it almost was gonna be a husband and mother situation but that soul was born again to you. Then that means there was some kind of uh, real manifestation Like she was so emotionally charged about that, that that soul had to be born as her son, but she didn't recognize it. Not at all. Electra, is that Electra, mother and son? It doesn't um, matter. I didn't quite understand Ellen, what is Electra? Electra, Oedipus, the complexes, it's, it just popped in my head. It, I'm not, it doesn't I, matter. I'm not, I'm not a psychology uh, major. It so is, it's literature, literature. Literature. But um, I, I don't know. what I find fascinating is that it's well known that gay people in general are considered further along on the spiritual path, which makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm not surprised, Ken, that you would be a talented writer and that you are. You are so expressive. Oh, I. So I, it, it fits perfectly. 
I'm starting to see that that's the, that's what's coming out of me now. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is what I've yearned for this, but I needed to crack open and to work through a lot of the stuff that was holding me back. Yes. Church wise. It's also interesting that the UUA, the universal Unitarian church is very accepting of the gay community trans anything that's not considered normal and i that's very encouraging for mankind let's say it's it's technically a church but not really a church i've attended sessions my aunt and uncle were members and their families and singles and gay people and just very open-minded individuals and i found that very interesting very enlightening and challenging to my intellect and my emotions, as opposed to the Roman Catholic church, which I grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't attend regularly, but when I have, I have found it. I don't know if you guys have ever attended a Unitarian church, but it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for that insight. Thank you, Ken. So I come back to Patricia. Patricia, do you have any more questions out of them? Oh, out of what was discussed, and I'll go back to you. Uh, oh, I'm so glad I asked the question, and I'm so glad you, you know, brought it today because um, April and Caesar like nicely talked about little different sides of, you know, what I experienced, and it it's almost like little pieces that making the total, you know. Uh, experience of it or understanding of what happened and then Ken wow <laughs> when you you catch my attention so much that I love listening to you so you are a storyteller you you the way you put it together it's just all you need right now someone to write it down and there you go there's your books there's your writing and you know, you don't have to be really the one holding the pen, but even record your voice because it's um, it's it's really interesting. I I just love listening, you know, to what you're saying, and uh, that's what books are. You know, those authors, like most of them, they talk about their own experiences. Sometimes they put it into uh, fictional characters. You know, like they're talking about someone else, but many of the experiences, what they're talking about is very universal. And um, so we can relate when we read about it, it's interesting to us because we are learning about the human experience that we also experiencing. So there's truth to that. And like Eckhart says, you know, we don't um, learn about the truth. It's just, we, rediscover it because the truth is so we kind of seeing it someone is someone else is telling us about it but we recognize it as the truth and we 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 being pulled towards it we resonate it resonates with us because even though it was another person saying it we already know that and um so that was that was incredible Thank you. And I think Ellen was talking about the Electra and Oedipus, the Slavromatology. So this is, <laughs> again, more, more other stories that were, you know, written and were told as the storytellers by those ancient people, you know, in theaters, in because that's all we do. Doesn't matter how many years, we just keep talking about the same thing. <laughs> really? Yes. Because... Uh, you know, even Shakespeare's plays and stuff, everybody, oh, go, it's classic, go to Shakespeare. And what is he talking about? To be or not to be? That's the question. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> it's almost, yes, like April said, it's all the realities. They're already happened. Time doesn't exist. We just, in this time, in this form, we almost getting another chance to re-experience and take it to maybe a new level you know it's like maybe we're being recycled 
<laughs> it's just until we get it, until we get it, because each, maybe each lifetime, it's a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. And that's why some people say, oh, you're an old soul, which means that, you know, you're five years old and you know more than people that lived in their 50s. Like, how is that? Right, that concept of time. And, uh, and yes, deja vu that I had um, was last week. I enrolled to a um, webinar with Tommy Robbins, powered by Tommy Robbins. Yeah, it was um, one of um, ladies that joined his um, company like three years ago, 2018. And there was Master Your Life. It's like design your life. And uh, it was interesting, three hours on the web. And um, they were talking about some new, old identity, new identity. And all of a sudden I'm sitting, you know, there's people from all over the world joining over 3000 people on the Zoom going through exercises. And it hit me. I'm like, I know I've never done this. And I'm sitting here and I'm feeling like, that is already, that already happened, that I experienced it. How is it possible? But it was so strong. And now when Caesar says, you know, look for significance because, you know, I kind of have intuition that maybe it happens because it's almost like the universe gives you proof that you're on the right path. That you, you were supposed to be there, but I couldn't understand why. Like I didn't get, what the actual message okay so it's a proof that i'm actually following some plan for myself so it's it's a good thing but what it really is <laughs> the message so that part i didn't um understand so that's why i i asked punam if maybe eckhart you know because i didn't i don't remember if he said anything about that if it's possible when we are so in the present moment that we actually are in touch with the oneness, but if everything happens in the now and it's fresh and it's just new and it never happened before, right? How can we have deja vu? But then- I heard something. April- I'm sorry. Responded to it saying that, you know, it's in that quantum field, there's a lot of, experiences and there is no time there so it's always now but so that's little still my mind I don't know it's still I'm kind of like sensing it like mm, playing with it but I think I didn't integrate it yet um fully so I thought that maybe deja vu is the way to integrate it like in your experience. But then like Caesar mentioned, get the wisdom, like cherish this moment because it's trying to tell you something. It's significant. And I think I missed this. I missed the significance of it. I was just a little like, ooh, <laughs> what is that? It's not possible that I was yeah, I've done this before, but why am I feeling like I did? <sighs> so next time you'll tune in more. Now that Caesar has shed the light on it, you'll be more in tune. All of you are so advanced and advancing, accelerating on your spiritual consciousness path that I feel that you are all old souls. You are all intuitive. Uh, picking up from April, uh, the insights, uh, it's all connected, absolutely connected. Eckhart made a little joke, but not a joke, on one of the YouTube videos I was listening to. He said, is there incarnation? He said, yes, every day we are reincarnated. Of course, that's one viewpoint. That's a, a simplified version. Another discussion would be the reincarnation that's connected to the deja vu we're talking about hmm. i just i just also have uh that's a very good point interesting really because it's a new always the, the moment is always fresh we we living it the first time but if we don't 
if we don't, oh, if, I, if we're not aware, we're gonna be living our karma, which is the conditioning. It's just a reaction. So in order to stop it, we have to be in the moment, present moment awareness. But I have a question to April and Caesar a little bit about that deja vu too. If energy, if energy, like when you're channeling something from the past or exactly from the past, it was always now. So it's in the quantum field or is it, how is it possible that Ken was in a form of the pilot or it's like this energy didn't become, let's say a flower, a little bit for a tree, a little bit for Ken, but not like the entirety of that energy that made Patrick the pilot became now completely 100% Ken, or is this just like mixture of other energies? I don't know if I'm saying it right. Like, if is it possible that let's say I was 200 years ago a person with experiences and then the same amount of energy became me today? So I'm kind of like having all of her in me or him and not just pieces of other people too. You know what I mean? That it's, I'm saying it right. One minute, uh, Patricia, because we have a question on the uh, okay. Facebook. Uh, Rachel asked this question, April. We, we'd go back to your question, Patricia. Hold on to that thought. So remember that thought. <laughs> so here we, here we go. Where Eckhart says, just be in the present moment. I'm saying, hold on to that thought. Um, so the question that Rachel asks, April, is how do dreams play into the power of now? Are they my subconscious playing out like a movie? So I'll let Caesar and you answer this question, and then we'll go on to Patricia's uh, question. The, the concept of the power of now that Eckhart's speaking of doesn't necessarily apply to dreams. He's talking about pull yourself into the present moment right now as you're living and becoming conscious, using your conscious mind to your frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is aware of time, space, cause, effect, reason, rationale. It knows that it's lunchtime. That's your conscious mind. Conscious mind says, I'm sitting here in a chair. Dreams don't necessarily, it's not necessarily present moment because it can be all time. Because again, when you go to bed, the idea is, the concept is, the theory is that your soul, your spirit leaves the body, goes back to source or goes back to Egypt or goes back to Iceland or wherever it wants to go. It goes back to 1800s. It goes to 2050. It does not have the, the, I don't want to say restriction of the present moment, but it doesn't have the present moment because it encompasses all time. So that's kind of one thing is we want to take that restriction of the power of now off of the dream world because there, it, that, that restriction is not there. So everything is happening right now in the dream moment, but it's happening right now in 2050 and in Egypt and in wherever you go, you're much freer. Is it your subconscious mind playing out like a movie? Yes. And your cells and your DNA and your past lives and your problems at work for today and all of that. So you can have, um, I have a friend, my, I don't personally do it, um, but I have a best friend who astral projects, meaning she leaves her body when she's sleeping and she goes places. She visits people. She travels. Me, I said, put me back down. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but I have had dreams and I have been places. Um, but, and I, and one of my funnest, funnest things to do in my sleep is to fly. 
I love to fly. I just, I just kind of do this little leap and I just literally, I fly around my house. It is the most funnest thing ever. I just love it. So it is so fun. Gosh. And um, I get so excited because it's so fun. And I'm like, come on, you can do it. Just, just go. Let's just lift up. <laughs> so anyways. The power of now doesn't necessarily apply to dreams because we are more energy, we are more free. And everything is happening in the now, but more likely when you're talking about subconscious and dreams, more likely what's happening is whatever is bothering you, again, this is, um, the mind doesn't like closed loops it, or open loops. It likes closed loops. So if you have an open loop about a problem in your life, and you want a solution, the mind will run that track. It will run that loop over and over and over and over until it finds the answer. And that is more likely what's happening with the subconscious mind in your dreams when you're sleeping, when you're trying to figure out a problem. Like I had a problem where <clears throat> I had a child at one point was seeing a counselor and we had seen like one counselor and another counselor. And what I was finding was that all these counselors were just active listening. They weren't actually uh, solving problems or giving coping skills. They were just active listening, which doesn't work. And in the dream, though, I had put a different child in the dream. I was in the counseling office with the counselor and the counselor says, I don't feel like your daughter's making much progress. And I said, well, are you teaching her anything? But it was the different kid. It wasn't. That's my subconscious mind working right? Playing out this movie. So because it was a problem in my current life, right? So when you're talking subconscious, it's more usually about either past problems you haven't resolved or new problems that you haven't resolved or, and or potential problems that you're worried about. Okay. Um, so again, when it comes to the dream world, basically take all the rules of human life and throw them away they don't apply you are free you're back into full energy form you ever listen to and i've listened to hundreds and hundreds of ndes near-death experiences they will all tell you that when they had to come back in the body it was very tight and they had to squeeze back in and it was so restricting because when you leave you are so expansive you are with all you are all you are with all there are no restrictions so that's how i understand it and that's how i see it beautiful thank you thank you so much april and i think uh we've discussed this before in uh again the book nature of personal reality by jane roberts Set says that uh, we have to break up our sleep cycle to actually allow our dreams to bring solutions. He says, don't sleep more than four hours at a time. Actually take four hours and then take a nap for two hours later on in the day. That's how the sleep cycle, because we sleep for eight hours, we don't remember our dreams. And because we don't remember our dreams, we don't realize how powerful uh, the lesson was because the soul is still trying to work like April you're saying soul is trying to work the problem out right, right? whatever its situation is and the answers are coming in dream form but we are not grasping the dream so I think Jane Roberts and Robert Butts they changed their sleep cycle after that lesson or whatever that chapter was in nature of personal reality but she is a channel, so she didn't have to change anything about herself. She has had to move into just like Abraham Hicks, right? Esther Hicks. So Caesar, you want to say something about the dreams and uh, subconscious mind? Well, dreams and the power of now, where does it stand? Yeah, like April said, I mean, when you're dreaming, it's just everything past, present, future. It's just oneness of all that is. Um, as far as the subconscious mind goes, um, in in regards to the sleep, you know, stage when you experience, I believe, when you go into the beta, 
and your mind is, you know, trying to, you know, reveal things to you, so to speak. So like a lot of times when people have dreams, it's because if you sat there and watched, uh, you know, a particular movie or a particular scene over and over and over and over again, or if you played a video game for five hours, you would literally see this when you shut your eyes. And chances are you're going to dream about that because that's what's up front and center um, at the time you go into your slumber, um, you know, moments before you go to bed. That's why they always say, um, Wayne Dyer really pushed on this one, you know, five minutes before you go to sleep every night is when you are literally supposed to just totally submerse yourself in gratitude because for the next four or eight hours when you sleep, that's what you're going to be marinating in, in that frequency. And that's a beautiful frequency to wake up in. And you pick up where you left off. The problem is, is when people wake up, thought rushes in and they don't ever get a chance to experience that gratitude again before they start their day off and create that type of momentum. So when your feet hit the floor in the morning, wherever you are, you know, wherever you, your frequency is, whatever state of mind you're in, you know, whatever mood you're in, um, that's what's going to start building momentum at the beginning of the day. And it's very imperative how your day plays out and, and what kind of attention are you going to give that to know what kind of momentum you're creating? Because at some point in the day, that's just going to carry you through um, autopilot. So um, the subconscious mind is, you know, this your inner being always knows the path to least resistance. Abe talks about it a ton, right? Um, so in the dreams, it's trying to push you to the solution, but not necessarily in the right direction all the time. Um, it could be revealing because our mind is funny and it plays tricks on us. So when you're talking about, you know, the conscious mind versus the egoic mind, um, you know, the, I believe that when you wake up the egoic mind, if it has any power over you and for 80% of the population, it does. And for even the ones that are mostly awake, um, that's still just a percentage of how you live your day in that state, you know, in presence. Um, so the subconscious mind will reveal things to you. Um, a lot of times in dreams, you'll see people that you don't think you know or recognize. These are people that you have had or will have experiences with um, either on this timeline or another. Um, again, usually, and, and there you go back to deja vu again. I know you from somewhere. Where did I see you? Probably in a dream. You just didn't pick them out of the crowd at the time. So, and then back to the memory. So the eyes have memory. The tongue has memory. You know, when you eat something that tastes good, your tongue can recognize that. But if you eat something from a different culture that you never had, it's not familiar. You can scan a crowd of a thousand people and pick out your friend a hundred feet away just in the mist, just because that memory just pulls it instantly. So um, contrary to that, the subconscious mind um, will reveal a type of movie as she asks in her question. Yes, it's kind of playing out a movie. It's giving you scenes, but your mind puts the movie together, puts the scenes together as a movie when you wake up. So that's another reason why it's important to when you wake up to be still. Um, all the teachers speak about being still, you know, when you awake. And that's for a reason. Um, listen to the inner voice. Listen to, you know, connect with all that is in that very moment when you open your eyes. And if you can really start doing that um, as a practice, you will then start remembering your dreams and find the significance in them a little more each and every time you dream. Um, I had to shut my dreams down for a while because it was, it was taking the fun out of life. Um, it would be a recurring thing. And then typically on the third day, the dream would reveal itself in form, you know, it would manifest. And I just shake my head and go, okay. And so then I started telling my friends, my workers, whatever, the people that I'm close to about my dream. And three days later, when it exposed itself in the, in the exact way it happened in the dream, we would all just look at each other and they started to think I was a really spooky guy. But um, dreams can be and are significant to what's happening in your daily life. Um, typically, I would just say pay attention to them because whatever it is exposing yourself, exposing itself in the dream probably requires attention, like April said. Um, 
an issue you're probably having in your life. So, you know, give whatever it is that the dream is referring to some thought and figure out if there's a, you know, something that's playing off the, um, you know, your well-being at that point and figure out what you got to do from there because the soul is pushing you in that direction, revealing itself to you in the movie scenes or the movie um, through the subconscious perhaps. Um, and that's when it's important to just, you know, get silent, get still and, and figure out what it is that uh, this is trying to reveal. Because I mean, quite honestly, the universe has constantly given us, you know, impulses. And when you're not present, um, you're not going to pick up on them impulses. It could be a lyric in a song. It could be a conversation. You're walking down the street and overhear a couple people talking and just, well, that was for me. Um, yeah, so the universe is constantly uh, revealing, you know, it's always pushing your souls, always pushing you in the direction of what, what you need best because it's leading you there through the path of least resistance. This is what makes us detour and try to do things our way instead of being led. And that's where that momentum is really important in the morning to be able to flow through your day and just allow one thing to take place. Uh, but, um, you know, do that in, in the highest vibrational frequency that you can get that kind of momentum go. That's the momentum you want to create is the high vibing momentum, everything else is nonsense. So when something comes to, you know, interrupt that, great feeling frequency don't allow it to gain any momentum because you have this momentum right here all day and then something comes and now if you want to give that any of your attention you want to feed it we know it's going to grow now on the sun your momentum starts doing this so stop <laughs> it uh, esther hicks's husband was great for that you know not allowing anything you know things are going to interrupt your momentum you know during the course of the day but it's important just to stop the momentum right there and get back to this immediately so yeah and then uh and let that flow you know carry you through your day it's very important momentum's good thank you so much caesar ken did you want to say something to rachel about dreams and subconscious mind or you satisfied with that april and caesar's answers um yes i'll i'll say a few things that um that I'm really, really finding. And so much what April and Caesar were saying, um, I just really, really enjoy listening. Um, it, it's just incredible how the messages come in, whether to me, it's whether through, through dreams, lucid dreams, it's uh, more and more listening to the messages and um, I know when I wake up in the morning and you just spoke about that last week Poonam about don't just get out of bed and just lay there and I did do that and then then this morning um, listening to what was going on yesterday and then it was shortly after 3 a.m. this morning, I woke up and it was like, it was like I had to get up and right away. Um, so was it a dream or it was just my higher self? And then right away, I just put on Joe Dispenser tapes. And then so much of what Caesar was just talking about is what he was talking about. So what's coming through dreams, thoughts, um, memory. Uh, there's so much that it just starts to nudge you and you realize that there's another language inside of you and something is trying to reveal something to you. And lots of times I'll feel it in my body. Uh, I'm getting to the point where more and more walking into the forest. So, it's, it's a very much getting into a stillness that it's almost like I'm dreaming while I'm alive. And I'm not even sure if that's what I would call it, but it's like information or downloading of information starts to come through. And then I start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And more and more I'm realizing 
that during the day, everything that's being said or revealed is part of the puzzle. Whether it's a dream, a book, coming in here, listening. And I'm like, it's just getting, it's like that momentum is just rolling and flowing. Um, and I'm really realizing that I'm feeling really good inside myself, not fighting it. So if, if I go to bed and if I'm not feeling that good, well, that will affect the dreams or anything else going on. And so I've been really just saying, thank you. I love you. Um, and saying everything's really good, but really feeling it. It isn't just words. And the momentum of this energy is just coming through more and more. And that's all part of also the synchronicity of what's going on in this group. And I think it's really, really, that was really helped me to start seeing another part of myself being developed that was undeveloped and part of my growth. So I'm realizing through the experiences that I'm going through, they're teaching me. And it's, um, it doesn't matter what I'm looking at and I'm getting this information in areas that, holy cow, by looking at that, that's helping me to see something over here. And uh, so it's really been incredible. Just by what we think about, we will draw in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Ellen, did you want to say something about dreams and the subconscious mind? The question that Rachel had. Actually, it's a related corollary. Eckhart in the Art of Presence, one of the Sounds True prior broadcasts available for free on YouTube. He had a retreat at some point in the past. He discussed many, many things. One was Carl Rogerian, Rogerian therapy, Carl Rogers, not in terms of dreams, but he said he felt as far as conventional therapy, Freudian, etc., that Carl Rogers, Rogerian therapy, was the highest form of what he considered legitimate therapy in that, interestingly, a, a patient made a comment that Carl Rogerian in his day had no facial expressions. He offered no talk back, no commentary whatsoever, no facial, no words to the patients. And that I believe it was a young man said to his mom or the mom said, you don't, you're not saying a word. You're not saying anything. And yet Eckhart felt that that was the deepest, most effective type of therapy. So <laughs> I meant today. And again, as Ken and everybody else said, there's so many things that you could Google and research. And it's, it's so the thirst for knowledge and connection is so strong that if I don't write it down, I'll, I'll not remember unless it pops in my head later. But I went, I really wanted to look up that Carl Rogers and Rogerian therapy because sometimes you think, well, that doesn't make any sense that you would just have a passive face and no response. And yet it's so fascinating to me that I would really be interested to see what's behind that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just had to mention that because it's an interesting uh, coincidence or corollary. I'm trying to remember what I, I do remember Eckhart talking about it, but I don't remember why it was therapeutic. Uh, I'm probably not remembering exactly the context either, kind of pulling it out of the blue. <laughs> I have a feeling that he was so uh, still, like the stillness or the presence was there, that that person worked out their issue as they were relating it. Because the therapist, the Rogerian therapist provided that stillness, that field of presence, right? So they figured out their own answers as that they were speaking. Sense the 
if I remember it correctly, that's how Eckhart explained it. That must be because then he was discussing being your own therapist. You have the answers, so it fits. Mm. And it was entitled this particular retreat, The Art of Presence. So perfect. No, no end to the fascinations. <laughs> Patricia, did you want to say something about the dream part? And then we'll go back to your question and April can answer your question. Uh, with dreams. For me, I had, I think, one dream once when I was flying. And just like April was talking about, it was the best dream I ever had. And I remember it now. <laughs> It was incredible. It was so incredible just being weightless and seeing it all and just going out and like, shh, just, it was so natural. I love this. I just would love to dream it every night like this, but I don't know how to bring it on. And um, for me, the dreams right now um, for a couple of weeks on and off, I'm dreaming about my last job. <laughs> I've been working through some job trauma, you know, some, a lot of limiting beliefs came up uh, in my last job. Um, it was six and a half years and a lot of things moved through and developed me and um, a lot of challenges. And um now I have the dreams that they want me back, uh, you know, that, but that's, I don't know if this is just my ego trying to say, you know, look, you know, you let me go, but you made a huge mistake and I need this to kind of for the ego to feel better. Or it's just reality is that maybe, you know, because the boss, um, Doug was, I had such a connection with him, such a strong spiritual connection. He gave me a book um, of Mark Nepo of Spiritual Awakening, Daily Awakening. And he said, here, Patricia, and he gave it to me two years ago. It's almost like I had to read a one chapter, one page, one entry a day because it was assigned to every day of the year. And... He said, here, I got it from my um, coach, from my life coach, because, you know, I had a problem too. So here, it's a very expensive book, but I know you're going to read it. I read the book every day and practiced and it didn't change anything. You know, year, year after I finished the book, six months or whatever, we still departed, you know, it's just then, but he was like offering me uh, things to do and telling me about my limiting beliefs, telling me that I have a choice, telling me to not, not overthink things, you know? So I almost feel like he was more of a life teacher for me than a boss. And then when I got confused, because I guess my, his expectations of me, he wanted me to really take over the business. He wanted me to run it. And I was including him all the time because I was respecting, this is your business. Every decision I make, I want to run by you. And he said, no, I don't want to know you do it. And it was like back and forth. And then his last text to me was that, you know, after I asked him for a referral for a different job, he said, I'm very disappointed because you left us shorthanded. And I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean I left you? You you let me go. <laughs> I never want to leave. So there is still, you know, very strong connection. I respect him and as a human being, as a friend, but the way like it's, he separated me, he gave me this opportunity to walk on myself. So I think that the dreams are keep nag nagging me. So but I don't know if it's just saying it's unfinished business or it's, um, you know, my ego saying, you know, 
they made a mistake and you want to be right. You want to prove him right that he's going to suffer because he lost you, you know, stuff like that. So, so yeah, but I thought that with the, all the spiritual spirituality and meditation and forgiveness and really sending love toward uh, him, uh, He's a wonderful husband, wonderful father. I'm like, I respect him in so many ways, but maybe I guess I put him on too much of a pedestal. And um, life was again telling me, you can't rely on an outside force to tell you who you are, to judge you, to give you a, you know, I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm even crying about this you have to you have to look at your um you have a pattern uh patricia of getting attached yes and like cling and hold on like it's like it it overtakes over like whether it's the ex-husband whether it's your child so learn that the universal law is impermanence of form souls will come in into our lives we and we learn our lesson from that soul and the soul will be taken away and it's as simple as that the present moment the isness of the present moment is your contract with that soul is over there's no oh i should have been at the job not at that's like all mental chatter the soul came, that soul came your ex-husband came or this person came or if, how many ever, you must have met hundreds of thousands of people in your lifetime. All of them came, they go away. They come, they go away. We are like bubbles. We are like little bubbles. We pop, another popped. Another popped out of our life, it's gone. Think of it that way, that that bubble popped and cut, cut that connection. And hopefully Lakshmi has helped you whenever she did the uh, chakra cleansing, get it done. Because what you need to do is learn to cut that umbilical cord because that's weighing you down. It's weighing you down to the point that you're like getting emotional. You're emotionally tied to all of this and get that emotion out, get the emotion, the charge. The thing that will cut it is the emotional charge. Stop having that emotional charge with the other person. And then you'll disentangle. You're in that quantum entanglement. And then in that quantum field, you're entangled with all these people, your ex-husband, your daughter, your this other person. And planetary intelligence is saying, cut, cut, cut. It's cutting you. <laughs> I, know. I don't and know. It's cutting everything. <laughs> you're going back and you want to cling and look at that. Look at that clinging, sticking. So the dreams. So the dreams are just my mind keep trying to put me back. Well, here, they're showing you a stickiness. There, yeah. What what's happening is is throughout the days, at some point, you are still like Poonam just explained, attached to him or that situation, that environment, something that you have not fully accepted, meaning let go of. Um, so as long as you're thinking about that situation or that person, it's going to be relevant in your life and it's going to affect you. And chances are it's going to cause you a degree of suffering or pain as you know it's coming out now. Um, so how do I do go? Dream? So I stop dreaming about this. Stop thinking about it. Then you'll stop dreaming about it. So as long as you are dreaming about it, it's saying this is in the front. What's the dream trying to tell you? What's the dream trying to tell you? You're still holding on to it. You know, everything that shows up is a result of our thinking and our doing. So it, what we feed grows. What you give your en energy to grows the situation. So what you're doing by thinking about it, talking about it, you could be watching TV and a scene will remind you of that. And then this comes up, what we just experienced, right? The emotions coming out. When the emotions happen is a beautiful time to really get it over with. Sit with it. Eckert describes this almost step by step, not almost. He describes it step by step. Sit with the emotion. 
you don't have to analyze the thought why we already know what the thought is what is you know relevant to um you can identify the emotion as sadness or whatever so you can identify the emotion and then sit there allow it to be say i feel you i give you permission to be there and embrace it and as quick as you can do this that is full acceptance that is letting go you have not yet accepted the situation, however it ended, why ever, whatever. You just have not accepted that. And there's that attachment that Poonam was just explaining to. She couldn't, have, I could have said it better. Nobody could have said it better. It's Sticky. the attachment. She said it's still <laughs> yeah. But when the, when the emotions come, comes up, you know, that's the pain body being awake. Yes. That is the opportunity to dissolve that dark spot, that darkness into the light of consciousness. How do we do that? Pure acceptance. Pure acceptance. It is what it is. It's over. On to the next chapter. Because until you let this one go, you're going to miss the next chapter. You're carrying that past around with you. The situation, the thought of him, the thought of the job, whatever it is, Patricia, you have to accept the isness of whatever that was. And that's letting it go. That's acceptance. That's non-attachment. The parable about the men carrying the woman across the lake and the monk or someone says five hours later, you're still carrying that woman? Right. Yeah. We let her go hours ago. Yeah, and that's that's why the dreams keep happening because it's on your, like uh, April was saying, it's on your- Emotional feel. Sure, yeah. You're holding it in the amateur where you say forgiveness and I've done this and I've done that. You're holding it in the emotional field still. So the attention in, on the emotional field that impermanence of form exists, mm -hmm. forms come, clouds, what is permanent is the sky. Clouds come, they go. All that arises passes away. How many more pointers does Eckhart have to give about the impermanence of form. That is like the fundamental thing that, you know, uh, Dr. Deepak Chopra used to say that when he was in a Thai monastery, they would keep an apple in front of them and meditate on the apple every day. And the apple is crumbling and dying. In a week or so, the apple is gone, right? Impermanence of form, the more we know from an inner knowing from our the level of our soul and spirit, the things are going to come, people, souls are going to come and they're gonna pass away and it's okay. The more we release from all these emotions and all the life situations. So let's go to April and ask her about the question that Patricia had about how do souls reincarnate uh, April? Does the same whole self reincarnate as the second person. Thank you. Yeah, so one of the things is, Patricia, um, and I tend to be the same way, as you move down this spiritual path, you will get to the point where Caesar is at, where you don't need a reason why. You don't need an answer. You jump to acceptance. You are not there yet. And I tend to not be there because it needs to make sense and it doesn't make sense to you. You need it to make sense. The way to make it make sense is to find the blessings in it. Once you find the blessings in it, you will find the reasons, then you can have peace. There are blessings in the bad. There are gifts in the bad. It's not just impermanence of form. That is part of it, but there are other blessings find the blessings, then you can have peace, then you can let go. The reason it's in your dreams is because you have not let go. That is true. As far as the soul goes, when I first learned this concept, I was super upset about it. I was like, this cannot be. Um, it was when my brother died, my, when my brother committed suicide. And I was thinking about him dying. And I was thinking about um, within a matter of a couple of days, actually it was 
that next day, he came to me and I hear him saying, he was like happier than anything. He was like, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And I'm like, yay, so happy for you, big jerk. So, um, so then I, I get to thinking, well, how is it that you can talk to me, but yet you can reincarnate in another body? Like, how is that? So I read that book, um, Billy Fingers is the book. It's the book, uh, I think it's called Billy Fingers, is it? No, it's called uh, Billy Fingers. It's, it's a girl who talks about her brother dying. Um, something afterlife of Billy Fingers or something. And it describes in there that your soul comes into the body. Your spirit stays with God, stays with source. So imagine your spirit is the universe. It is expansive. It is all. It's part of God. And you just put your toe in down here at earth. Your toe is the soul. Your toe is the part that goes in the body. Not all of your spirit, all, not all of it goes into the person. Only a portion goes into the person. So for the most part, there's, and that is why, again, there's always a part of you that is able to connect to source because you're always still connected. There's only a portion of you that's in the body. From my understanding, it's pretty much the same portion. It's the same part of the, it's, it's kind of like the same part that is coming back. So it's not like Ken is fragmented and part of him is Ken and part of him is Pat, Patrick and part of him's right? So Ken comes down, that part of the toll comes down, it lives this lifetime it goes back up, it reunites. Patrick comes down, he has the lifetime, he goes back and he, he unites, right? So it's not like a bunch of fragments. Um, it's so hard to explain and make it make sense. Like I can see it, I can sense it, but to explain it, it's just. No, you, you explained pretty good, I, I, okay. I get because I don't want to confuse you. So there is a part of you, and that's the part that Eckhart and all of them really talk about that um, when they say nothing has actually happened to you in this lifetime. Nothing's actually happened to you because part of your soul is still with God. Part of your, it's your soul that's in there. Nothing happened to your soul. It's the human that experienced this. It's the human that experienced the divorce, the, the abuse, the losing the job, the losing the house. Nothing really happens to the soul. The same soul has these different lifetimes, but where it's getting confused, and that's why I almost think I need Kelly like to jump in here, is... because we, we talk about how there's no sense of, there's no time. So technically I could still tap into Patrick, but that's because once something is, it is, it's always is, it's always there. And once an energy, something is linked, they're always linked. So you guys and I are always linked now, we're linked forever. So on our next lifetime, we're gonna be neighbors. Because we're always linked. <clears throat> so energetically, all of Ken's souls are linked. But the one soul is the one that's gathering all the... The one spirit, the one that's connected with God is the one that's connecting all the information. I don't know if that makes sense. Right? It's almost... So this one soul is gathering all this information for all these lifetimes, but it does come down into Ken. It does come down into April, into Caesar, but it's really just got the toe in. 
Okay, does that make sense or no? Did I confuse you? You did not confuse me. Okay, <laughs> it's could kind I, of hard to. Could I, I just I, say something, April, on that? Yeah. Okay, when you were mentioning, I'm I'm realizing now that Patrick, and what happened to me when I wanted to write the book, in this life is I wanted to be loved. That was the missing piece. So I wasn't loved in the 80s. And then I was still looking. And then when my mother died, I had a dream. Okay, here comes the dream. And she says, I'm so sorry that I wasn't there for you. That I couldn't give you what I should have given you because I didn't work through my own stuff. And you've been looking your whole life from all the women you've been with to be loved. And because I wasn't the one to give you that when you were a child, you kept looking at outside yourself and now you need to love yourself. But ultimately it's your soul, your spirit that's on that quest. And that's why you had so many lifetimes with the same lesson. Yes. Right, you see yes. that? Yes. Yes. So in what I'm seeing, like, so what I'm feeling now as you're talking and as Caesar's talking with Patricia, and I'm like, okay, she had a job. She's with her daughter. And then even her, her boss said, you're fired. And then she wanted to go back and she says, well, why do you want me? You fired me. And so what it is, it's all her. She's still going back. There's something that isn't, that hasn't come to her. And I feel like she's still looking for that missing piece. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure how. And to when she finds it, then she'll have peace. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I don't know if maybe Caesar can clear this up or not, but so basically you have the part of your soul, your energy light body that is stays connected with source and a sliver of it comes down into this person. Okay. But because there is no such a thing as time, we can energetically tap into Patrick or whatever, right? Parallel timelines is like this. If you take, you know, those cartoons they used to draw and you can flip through them and you can see, but it's one. And so what one cartoon is draw and the person's like this and the next one, they're like this, then they're like this, then they're like this, this, this. That's per, each one of those is a new timeline, each second. So new timeline. New timeline, new timeline, new timeline, new time. That, those are all, those are all timelines, but they're all one also. It's all one movie. It's all connected, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to understand, but if you think of those, when they flip through those cartoons that they draw, each one of those pictures is a new timeline, each moment. That's what they mean when they see each moment is a new timeline. Okay. And they all make a whole, but each section is still there, right? Each section is still important and still needed and still doesn't go away. It stays there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm helping Poonam or not, but. <laughs> I think she got a glimpse of it. Yeah. So she's understanding it. So thank you so much, April. And I, um, what Abraham Hicks um, actually says, or Esther, I mean, Esther Hicks channeling Abraham says, is we are strands of consciousness. So it's not so much as one single person came into Ken. It's almost like, um, just think of each and every one of us as being energy. So we are just vibration in our essence. And at that level of vibration, we can vibrate at different frequencies. So they are different strands of consciousness. And what she said, somebody asked her that uh, Jerry Hicks, her husband had passed away. And uh, she said, uh, somebody asked her, do you not miss your husband or something? And she said that I know some strands of consciousness that were in Esther were also the strands of consciousness in Jerry. So that's the connection as well. So it's like beyond words, it's indescribable, right, April? Like to explain all this, 
But once you develop that presence power, then you kind of know that energetically, who am I attracting and who is, who do I share these strands of consciousness with? Because you will know that probably your daughter is somebody that you share strands of consciousness with, right? So it's something, something like that. Um, so maybe this ex-boss of yours is you share some strands of consciousness and that's where the bond resides, but you can always let go because somehow planetary intelligence has separated the two of you. So let's go to Caesar and ask him, uh, do you have any more than what April said? Thank you so much, April. That was phenomenal. Yes, indeed. So to Patricia really quick. Um, so the relationship there with this gentleman may or may not have been something that's unresolved in your past because as april just had mentioned we experience the same people in different forms in different timelines your neighbor could now be your mother your friend could now be your lover understand so this could be something that's unresolved that you didn't get right the last time it is now resurfaced he's playing the same role in a different body and giving you the opportunity so maybe just maybe the gift or the blessing in this whole thing that april was speaking about this opportunity presents itself not the situation you know presents itself as an experience but as an opportunity to extract the blessing or the lesson perhaps maybe just maybe that gift that he left you through the situation or the blessing or the lesson that you're supposed to extract out of it just might be acceptance. Maybe this situation occurred so you can learn acceptance and how to let go and understand the law of permanence like Buddha was saying. As far as the reincarnation, let's say, you are the consciousness as the driver of a car in the United States. And you smash that car and the car is totaled. And then you decide you're going to move to Germany. You're still the consciousness. The vehicle is now wrecked. Done. Junkyard scrap. Done. Being molded down. <laughs> melted and turned back into another vehicle so now you go to germany and you purchase another car same consciousness as the driver different vehicle same way through life same consciousness different body that's all it is my one penny wow <laughs> that's 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 fascinating it's very good also metaphor to um you know picture mental picture that um it's not that patrick reincarnated into ken it's really the consciousness that was patrick and now it's ken right using was using patrick for the experience that needed to use in patrick's body and now is uh, living in Ken and experiencing what Ken needs to yeah, as Ken, right? Yeah. What we do know is that energy never dies. It transforms or transmutes itself. Same energy. And as April pointed out a few times, how we are an extension of source energy. So if we are just an extension, that means a part of us is still there, just as she explained perfectly. So when the energy of the energy never dies, the vehicle in which transports the energy around as this glob um, never changes. The energy never changes. This will, this has got to be bound by the law of impermanence too, right? It has to go. Everything that is will one day not be, except the energy, because that never dies, transforms or transmutes. Same energy wherever you go, different ballgame, different vehicle, different body. Right. But because the lifetime with Patrick was also energy, that never goes. So Correct. it's not like Patrick is still like alive, alive, like Ken is. 
no. but the energy of Patrick's life, because energy can't be destroyed, it's still reachable, energetic wise. So and psychics, mediums, we can still tap into it. Absolutely. And think about what she just said. So now there's an expansion that just took place. And that's exactly why we came here. Because everything is constantly expanding and growing. Everything. As your consciousness is. So in a sense, that was the dream. But I wasn't like sleeping to have that dream. That was something that was said to me uh, about having a past life. What dream are you talking about? The one that we live in or the one that you experienced? No, no, I, I, I know. No, I'm just thinking that when I was Patrick and then even when in the 1980s when I was a writer, so those memories were, were coming up for me. And that's what they, they, they came up through someone else. And then I was able to put things together. So I actually didn't have a dream, but right. that was the dream. Yeah. Showing right up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and then you mentioned how you wasn't, no, I'm sorry, go ahead, Puno. No, no, go ahead, finish, uh, Caesar. then I'll say something. I was going to say, you mentioned that how you wasn't um, loved to the 80s, correct? Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, well, you, you was always loved. Um, you just didn't have the realization of love itself because that's exactly yeah, what you are, and you said it yourself, so you... Exactly, you, that's you what I was, yeah. I felt like I was... The realization. You, Right, I was searching and looking for love. And the yeah. same thing there goes to the, uh, the validation. You know, Patricia, same thing. You know, you're looking for the outside validation. Exactly. Not necessary. So even though we have different stories, I'm starting to say, wow, there's a similarity or a mirroring going on in a reflection. I'm like, okay. And then realizing how we're here and how everything else has been working. I'm like, okay. It's like putting the pieces together um through uh, the spiritual awakening so to speak um and just see the similarities it's just incredible yeah i remember when i started realizing the synchronicities that took place every day you know when you go to call somebody you, as soon as you pick up your phone it rings and you're like wow that's crazy i was just dialing your number you know at first when you start paying attention to this stuff that's oh my god wow like 20 times a day and after a while, you almost just expect it. Like, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about calling Jason. Bam, he calls. It's like, it's, it's crazy. But you get used to that stuff. And, you know, the, the biggest thing to do is pay attention to your state of, you know, um, where your frequency, where your vibrational frequency is when things show up in your life. So you can correlate the two and say, wow, you know, because you create, again, where we started, everything that shows up in your life. Period. As we increase in consciousness, this accelerates as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I, constantly growing and expanding, yes. I would love to explore <laughs> anyone's experiences in the future, anytime, uh, about the connection between my dad had dementia, Alzheimer's, my niece is a grown 30-year-old autistic young woman. I believe those souls are also connected and have incredible, based on my experiences with my dad and my niece, amazing, insightful, old soul, uh, psychic connections as well. Something to explore or think about in the future if anyone is interested or has similar experiences. Uh, am, I, am I reaching or does that make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> We can bring it up uh, next time, Ellen, because it's almost like an uh, hour, 40 minutes. So I wanted to kind of, <laughs> time went by fast today, right? Um, the one thing I wanted to say is uh, when uh, Caesar was talking about the car example, it doesn't even have to be like it's in a different country. It can also be a different gender. It can be your uh, male and um, African-American or built, you're a male in Africa and next lifetime you're going to be a male in maybe in Dutch. Yeah, Norwegian. we didn't say you had to be if you were had a Honda here, you don't have to go to Germany and get a Honda. You can have any Honda. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, in Set Speaks, I think uh, what Set says is sometimes uh, every, every soul has to 
take the female form as well as the male form. And the female form, I think he said, is consecutive lifetimes. Like you do the female form, but not necessarily. Uh, but that is for true that if you're a male, so you know, so many people say, and this is what um, even Seth brings up is how many women say, or even if they're gay women, right? They say, I hate all men. Well, in one other lifetime, you are a man. What? Why do you hate all men? Or the mm -hmm. reverse, right? If you're a um, man, you may say, I hate all women just out of your experiences. And Seth says, but in the other lifetime, you are a woman. How are you hating yourself? R right? So uh, that's the thing. We think in very much in this 3D world, but everything is happening at the same time in the timeless realm. Everything is in Anita Murjani, um, like as her spirit was leaving the body, she explains it like she could see everything, like she could see her brother arriving at the airport, her mother coming to the hospital, um, everything happening at the same time. And that gives us the glimpse that in the timeless realm, there is no past, future, past lifetime, the past lifetime of Patrick is still happening as Ken in this lifetime is happening, as well as Ken of the 1880 is still happening, while Ken of this present moment, we may call it the present moment, but there is no nothing called present moment. Right. Time, this is, there's just an isness to this. That's it. Right. So um, Vidya and John have joined again um, online with us. And so eternally grateful to all of you for joining and everyone online. I know Christina and Gustavo have joined and Summer. Louise was online. Um, I saw Summer as well um, and Rachel for the question. And there were others. Uh, Glory, I think, had joined. So. Uh, April, Caesar, Ken, Ellen, and Patricia, thank you so much for making it an incredibly amazing conversation. Merry Christmas to all of you. Happy holidays. Enjoy. Much love. Many blessings. Good night. Infinite blessings. Thank you. Much gratitude. Good night. Eternally grateful. Thank you. Bye.